Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another installment here on the Jegna Institute channel. I am Brandon Jones. Just wanted to stop by, share some thoughts um, as we close out 2020 and get into the new year. And people often ask me, Brandon, what can black people do to get better? <laughs> what can black people do to um, to, st to stop being in the struggle that we're in? How do we heal our trauma, things of that nature? And one of the things that I've been grappling with over the last three years, <clears throat> it's been this concept of us being addicted to whiteness and white standards and white values. And I came across a man by the name of Dr. Uh, Jerome E. Fox. And I believe I first heard of him on Carl Nelson's broadcast. And for folks that don't know who Carl Nelson is, Carl Nelson is one of our legendary um, talk radio hosts in the black community. He's been around for a long time on several different networks. And he's currently um, has a show on, um, I think it's, he's broadcast out of D the DMV area. I can't even remember the name of the show. But anyway, the Carl Nelson Show. Check out the Carl Nelson Show. He has great guests. Um, they don't always record their their interviews and their topics that they have. So you got to kind of catch it live. Otherwise, you will miss a lot of things. Um, but that's one of the issues that we have all over when it comes to black media is being able to catch up to the spaces and the places that we're in and make sure that we have the content that's recorded. It's one of my big beefs with KMOJ, which is our local, uh, the people station here in the Twin Cities, is that they don't record. Stuff. <laughs> I mean, they just started doing it more, but there's been so much, so much valuable information and so many just people that have come through and have shared you know, constructive and quality information that's just gone. We have to do better at that. So. Part of the reason why I'm starting to do more YouTube um, and now Facebook Lives as well is to share information. You know, we have to be able to develop and cultivate our thought leaders um, because that's how we get out of this. That's one of the ways that we get out of the situation that we're in. So I have to be able to provide constructive content to help people think a little bit differently and move forward. Peace to VC. I see you in the chat. Thank you for joining me today. I am not going to be on extremely long. I'm not going to take any calls. We're going to save folks coming in and talking for Ask the Jagna on Mondays, but I will randomly just be popping up talking about topics that come to mind. Uh, Peace, LeVar. Welcome. So I want to talk about being addicted to white. And I know that that's a very controversial <laughs> topic. Um, you know, people, as I said on Monday when I went live for the first time, is that my Facebook is a conglomerate of random things. I have students, I have former clients of mine, <laughs> I have family members, I have colleagues, I have people that only know me from particular spaces online, people that I work with. Like it's just all types of folks in there. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how this manifests and develop um, as we move forward. Cause a lot of folks are focusing on the Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, um, feel free to join the Jegna.org Facebook group or ask the Jegna Facebook group. It's just Jegna.org. You can add yourself to that group. I'll try to drop a link at some point. You can also find the link in the description to this video um, and also be able to and also make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. And again, it's just my first and last name, Brandon Jones, and then Jegna. You should be able to find me. If you type in Brandon Jones in YouTube, you will find a a uh, football player who used to play for the University of Texas. His name is Brandon Jones as well. He's actually in the NFL now, but he was a big time recruit out of Texas, went to UT, was a Longhorn, and now he's in the NFL. I think he plays for the Titans. But um, if you just type in Brandon Jones, you'll find him. You got to put in Jegna. And if you put in Jegna, you'll find me as well. So make sure you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel as we go. But I want to dive into this book. So um, I mentioned his name before, uh, Dr. Jerome E. Fox. He created that. He wrote this book, Addicted to White, the Oppressed in League with the Oppressor, a shame based analysis. And what he did was pretty phenomenal. I mean, Jerome E. Fox, if you Google him, you'll find a few interviews that have been recorded and shared. But he did. He doesn't like to like be out in public, which I don't blame him. You know, he's, he's somebody who has kind of got himself off the grid. He does his teaching thing. He helps people in, a, in his local Philadelphia area and he keeps it moving. Uh, which I don't blame him because doing this work, being a public intellectual, uh, being a black thought leader comes with a lot of um, criticism. And a lot of folks don't do it, especially if you're doing it in a way that's quote unquote unapologetic. I know we use that term all the time. But if you're doing it in that manner, people are going to come after you. People that look like you, uh, people that don't look like you. And it's important that we protect these intellectuals, especially people who are giving out constructive information. And the crazy thing is the information we give doesn't just help black people, it helps other folks too. But still you are demonized when you bring 
information that is counter to the mainstream narratives, which gets into the context of being addicted to white. So addicted to white, ultimately what Jerome Fox did was he took the concept of 12 steps from the chemical dependency world. And for most folks, you may not be familiar with 12 steps. You may be more familiar with things like um, Alcoholics Anonymous, with which they ultimately use a 12 steps framework for helping people recover from alcoholism. Now, 12 steps has been proven to help with other chemical dependencies as well, but it originally started off with working on curving alcohol addiction. So what he what what uh, Jerome Fox did with his work is he said, what it, what is it about black people that we can't quote unquote recover from racism, white supremacy? Why can't we do it? And he looked at it from this framework of 12 steps. So he put together this book and this book is a workbook slash actual text that you can utilize to overcome your addiction to, to white, believe it or not. And it's funny because people like him don't get brought up in anti-racist circles. Uh, you'll get your, you know, Robin D'Angelo's. Now you're starting to hear more of folks like Resma. Shout out to him. Uh, but you don't get folks who are talking about the other end of anti-racist work, which is undoing the anti-blackness that black folks have uh, associated them. Not associated. We've been cultivated in a lot of anti-blackness. And it's important that we got to do our work, too. And that's one of the things that I always keep in mind myself as I do work in the diversity, equity, inclusion space professionally is that a lot of that work is aimed at helping white people not be racist. But the thing with that is that's only half of the puzzle for talking about eliminating racism for black folks. We as black people have to do our stuff as well. <laughs> What's up, Wolfman? I see you. Hey, Michelle Jewell. What's up, Brian? I see y'all in the chat. Um, yeah, addicted to white. And I, and I want to share the five concepts that he lays out early on in the book. He talks about these white values that we hold as black folks that we need to work on in order for ourselves to, quote unquote, recover from what has happened. You know, we talked a lot about um, we talked a lot about uh, Monday about and we hear this all the time that something's not wrong with us. Something happens to us. And I shared that I have an opposing view than a lot of people on that, that something did happen to us and something is wrong with us. Both of those things can be right at the same time. And I, as someone who is in the academy, who does teach, as and someone who is in this psychological space and tries to help my folks as best as possible, is the fact that I can't let go of the fact that something is wrong with, like, collectively, we have an issue. We have multiple issues that we have to work on. I was talking to uh, a sister earlier today, and um, we were prepping for a podcast that she's getting ready to launch. She wants me to be a guest on there, and she was pretty much talking about this, like, well, what do we do? And I told her, I said, you know, if white people disappeared, let's say the sun decided to shine in 2021 and just white white folks out. <laughs> OK, let's just say they just got wiped out. Black folks will still have the same issues that we have due to our addiction and our codependent relationship to white folks. All right. We would we would I think we probably would be even worse off if white folks just left us alone. And I say that because we have developed in this current time, we have developed with white folks for so long that we have this codependent relationship. So if they're gone, what do we do? And what Jerome Fox was saying is, since we have this addiction to white, we have to focus on recovering from that in order to be healthy. I talk a lot about anti-blackness. That's a term that's starting to actually be utilized more in this space of dismantling racism and dealing with anti-oppression and anti-racism. And it's 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 important for us to keep in mind that racism, white supremacy has created all these additional factors that imp impact our lives. So when we think of things like capitalism, you could put capitalism in a white spin, but it doesn't have to be. But in our minds, we've been conditioned to think that capitalism is white supremacy. That's not necessarily true. People have been practicing capitalistic ways for a long time. That's just the current way that we view it and how we term it today. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a white thing. They just may be some of the better collective groups of or ethnicities or people who are functioning with capitalism. But that is not the only thing. And if we want to be honest, and for folks who look at, you know, uh, um, neopolitics um, and are more like they look at politics from more of a global standpoint, they're not white folks aren't doing the best economically. It's really uh, Chinese and folks in China who are doing it. 
<laughs> Wolfman said we need to leave him alone. But I, I part of me agrees with that. But another part of me is like, if we do leave white folks alone, where does that leave us? Because if we think about it, we're kind of like orphans as a people. We don't have a home base to go to. We can say the continent, but the continent is the biggest continent on the planet. So we can't just show up in Africa and think that we're going to be okay. Because guess what? African folks, all different types of African folks have also been impacted by colonialism, which is an offshoot of white supremacy. So that's even foreign to us. And a lot of Africans are trying to get here. If we want to be keep it completely real, a lot of African folks are trying to get to the United States. So we have to be honest about what we need to do and how we need to undo our addiction to whiteness. If that's what is the issue, um, we have to figure out how to undo that to move forward. So I'll lead off with that um, and I'll start sharing here in a moment some of the values that uh, Dr. Jerome E. Fox posed to us. So the first value he posed, the first white value, he said, everything white is good, superior, or valuable. Everything black is bad, inferior, and worthless. And I think we see that. Where's the wealth? <laughs> the, the wealth is in a lot of places. It's in land. It's in water. And it's starting to be in Bitcoin. And I don't know nothing about Bitcoin besides how it's moving right now. So I'm not even going to dive into that. I'll, I'll let Dr. Boyce Watkins try to hip you onto some Bitcoin. <laughs> um. But yeah, so again, the first white value is everything white is good, superior, or valuable. Everything bad is black, inferior, worthless. I think this is something that we see all the time. If you watch Disney movies, you see it. It's pro it's in the propaganda everywhere. If you, if you just watch your local news, and if you live in a major city, you're going to see the 15-minute segments on all the bad things that are happening where the black people are. And, and truth is told... Bad stuff is happening. We can't just act like this is this made up stories. Like we, just, I mean, murders happen all the time. But due to our addiction to white, it depends on how we actually accept what is actually happening and how we actually have an emotional response to it. For example, and I almost wanted to postpone the show because locally here in Minnesota, we just had a police involved shooting again where a black person was murdered. It was a Somali gentleman. Okay. Another one. And I was going to postpone it because I wanted to use this as an example. But already, due to that shooting that took place, we are people are out. People are out protesting. People are out trying to figure out what's happening. They're supposed to be releasing footage of the event. I haven't seen anything just yet, but that's supposed to come today. And to me, it really, part of me, I, I agree with it. I think we should be protesting out there doing something. But part of me is also hurt because I'm, I've been in positions. Um, I had to leave a job recently. Because black kids are getting killed all the time. Black people, period, are getting murdered all the time. But it doesn't get the same amount of attention or draw until a white officer or a white person does it. And that hurts. Because this shooting that happened yesterday, compared to the killing that happened with George Floyd back in May, there have been a lot of black folks in the city, in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, that have been shot and have died. And we haven't had the same response. And that frustrates me because those folks who need help, who need things paid for, those are the pro they came to my the program that I read that I helped run. It was a conglomerate of folks, but we were the folks helping them, making sure that they have food at the funeral, getting bus tickets for folks to come to the funeral that lived out of town, sending people out of town, trying to prevent people from getting murdered. Like those are the things that we did. And it doesn't get that attention until a white person takes the life, which to me goes back to what Dr. Jerome Fox was saying. Having that addiction to white, when a white person takes your life, it has more value and more attention than when your wife is taken from a black person. And I think that that is insane. We have way too much stuff happening in our communities that are leading us down this road. So, again, it's more valuable for a white person to take your life than a black person that takes your life. That is insane. Thinking that white, everything white is good, superior, and valuable is a very, is a huge detriment to us. Um. Yeah, <laughs> Lucio, you know what I'm talking about. You got people up here. You know how it gets down here in the Twin Cities. It's crazy. Uh, it's all types of stuff going on. But one of the things that's important for us to keep in mind is that all white people ain't got it good. For some reason, we think that all white people got money. <laughs> we think that, you know, white folks just have happy lives. And they have some of the most twisted, messed up stuff going on you can imagine. 
And you won't know it because we usually stay in our own circles. But if you get into some of those circles and you hear about things, or maybe you get a job where you're working for a county, you'll start to see that there's some twisted stuff that happens in their community too. But we've been conditioned to see this white value and have them on the esteem that all their lives are perfect when their lives are just as jacked up as ours is. It's just manifested and broadcasted a lot differently. And that's the thing. Also, they'll t typically a lot of times they'll have different resources to deal with their issues versus how we deal with ours. But when you don't control your media, you don't control the narrative. When you don't control economics, you don't control how the how the resources are displayed in communities. Therefore, some people's problems get handled differently than others. So we have to keep in mind that for us, we have issues that we cannot think that white people don't have because they do too. They have similar issues, which we can look at the opioid epidemic that's been going. Now, we haven't heard a lot about the opioid epidemic during COVID for some strange reason. But before COVID, it was something that was being talked about more and more and more. COVID-19 happens. It's like opioid epidemic has gone. Please believe many jobs that have been lost, many homes that are going to be foreclosed on soon. The, ep the opioid epidemic is about to be a huge issue across the country, especially in those rural areas where the economic system was already messed up. So we need to keep that in mind as well and stop thinking that just because something is white, it is right or it is good or it is valuable because a lot of times it isn't. But a part of one thing, and I'm, and I'm probably going to talk about this at no, another one of the values. One of the things we got to keep in mind is that we have white values as black people. We have adopted white culture. We still hold essentially our culture as well. But as American folks, we have picked up the white American value system. It just plays out differently due to our axiology. I know that's a big word. I'll break that down at a later time. But ultimately what it is, is our how we view the world and how collectively we have our value system or how we uh, operate throughout our value system. So we have white values, believe it or not. And just like they view white as good, superior and valuable, same way we do. And this is why you see Karens running around here wilding out about cell phones that they left in Uber <laughs> and all those types of things, because they believe that what they say goes and that they have the, uh, the right, the constitutional right to do what they want. And we need to make sure that we have our own constitutional rights as a people. And again, I ain't saying nothing bad about white folks. I'm just pointing out some things that we see all the time. They can take it out they want. So white value number two, tangibles are valuable intangibles are worthless hence things to be pursued more vigorously than relationships this goes to dr edwin nichols many people have no damn idea who dr edwin nichols is probably one of the more brilliant people we've had a black man in this country one of the most brilliant minds we've had in this country and he created uh this axiology chart that talks about different groups and how they base their morals and value systems and one of the things that he identified for the European and, and white people is that they're more person to object people. For black people, whether that's African, African-American, Caribbean Islander folks, black folks in Brazil, et cetera, we are more people to people with our axiology. So our value system comes in the collective. Here's a good example. And he talks about natives, indigenous folks. He says they're more people to spirit um, or universe. He talks about... Um, folks that he considered to be Asian. Yeah, I think he, yeah, he also clumped Asian folks in, oh yeah, he clumped in like Arabs in with the Asian folks. And he said with that collective group of people, they're more people to culture people or people to group people. So the way that they function is how the group functions. If everybody's doing something, then that's what they're gonna do. And you see this with like Asian schools, like they all learn the same way. They work collectively in a group in a communal piece. That's how they, that's their value system. He said for Latinos or Latinx folks that they were like indigenous folks. They were more a person to, to spirit, a person to nature or universe, universe. Now, with white folks and with black folks, now when he talks about white folks being person to object, that is those things that are tangible things, right? So again, white person to, to tangible things. So white people, what do white people measure themselves off of? They measure themselves off of... Um, my house, putting my kids into college, you know, the type of car I have, how much miles I was able to save on it, the price that I was able to negotiate, um, you know, the, how my lawn looks, the job that I have, getting a promotion, uh, being a part of a board, 
sending my kid to X school for this reason. Those are all objective things, right? They're, they're markers of success and movement and, and um, social economic development. But at the end of the day, they're object things. That's how they function as a people. So if you're a white person and you don't reach those standards or you don't take care of your families and things like that, then what ends up happening is you are not functioning correctly. And quiet as it's kept, they used to be a lot more uh, uh, vicious towards one another when they didn't. So back in like, for example, one of the examples is like welfare. So welfare was created in after World War, I think it was World War One. I. I believe it was World War One. Well, welfare has been around in different elements, but what we know welfare to kind of be today is after World War One. I, I believe it was created for white women who became widows. So when their husbands went over to war and they died or they came back severely injured and they could not make a living anymore, the government put in place economic resources to help these women. Because at that time, being a woman and being single, you were looked at as strange. You were looked at as weird. And sometimes you were kicked out of your family. So you were supposed to be married. You were supposed to end up having babies and creating a family back in those time, back in that time period. So, again, it's about those tangible things. If you don't have those tangible things, then you're worthless. And that's what we end up seeing. So from their value system, it's person to object. For black people, our version is people to people. And this is why you hear things like, oh, man, we just need to get together. We need to have more conversations. We need to, you know, we need to work better together. We need to build group economics. The reason why you hear those things is it comes deep within inside of us as, as our cultural nature is that we are people to people. Now, you can have individual success all the time, but we separate that all the time. This is why you can have Oprah's and LeBron James's and Serena Williams and Russell Wilson's and all these people. We can have those individual successes. And in a white paradigm, those people are looked at as successful black people. In a black paradigm, those people are looked at black people who have done something, but they don't represent everybody. See the difference there? We have to be able to understand how uh, the axiology of white folks and our folks affects how we view ourselves. Now, as I stated earlier, black people, we do have white value systems, even though it just plays out a little bit differently because we're black. <laughs> And our value system is twisted due to our trauma. So we also, even though we're people to people, it's through a trauma lens. We also have that up. We have we have that person to objective viewpoint. This is why we stunt on one another. This is why we need to get the Louis belt. But you got on some Levi jeans with a Louis belt and some New Jordans. That's that objectivity. It's I have something of value. I'm gonna show it off. This is why we gotta have the bins. So so for the black folks. Who get into professions, you want to get a Beamer or a Benz when you come up and you make that $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 a year if you haven't reached six figures, right? We go out there, we want to stun on one another. That's that object. That is a white American culture objective thing that we do. And we don't, we don't realize it because we, we're so, we, we have this trauma lens that's based off our historical, intergenerational, and race based trauma that everything white is good. So we just see it as a white thing, but not understanding how we do it as well in various different social economic statuses. So I can talk about the professional black folks. I could talk about the black folks who aren't professional or blue collar black folks. I could talk about Buki and Ray Ray in the hood. We have the same type of uh, cultural paradigm as they do because we are engulfed within their culture. Yes, they do force their values on us, and they do it. The force, though, is a soothing force, all right? So thank you for sharing that with me. They do force it, but it's not a force that you think would be harmful. It's a force that makes you feel good. This is why folks like Tariq Nashi says things like butter biscuits. That's them forcing their value systems on us, that material status, that being able to have something so you can stunt on other black people. That is our conditioning. This is why when we get a new car, we want to drive it around and turn the music up so people look at us. That's the same thing. Or we want to, when we get our outfit, we get a brand new outfit and we want to post that thing right away before it get dirty. You want to post that outfit, but this is even before Instagram, you want to make sure everybody's seen your outfit <laughs> before you, you know, right when you got to the party, you want to, hey, I'm up in here, right? We're doing our thing because you want to be seen. It's the same thing. Now we can just post the outfit on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snap and all that good stuff. But this is the same thing. This is where we're at. So our material status is no different than theirs. It just has this trauma lens on it as well that makes it twisted. And then we start to fight each other and hate each other because somebody has a material and somebody doesn't. That's our trauma. 
All right, let me get to the next value because I didn't plan on being on too long today, but I just wanted to throw something out there as we get ready for 2021 and talk about the things that we need to do. White value number three. White oppressors are trustworthy recorders and interpreters of history and reality. History and reality. White oppressors, whether you, if, and I know white people are watching this. I got white people all over, all of my social medias. You might not consider yourself an oppressor. That's on you. <laughs> I'll let you determine if you are an oppressor or not. But think about this, everybody. White oppressors are trustworthy recorders and interpreters of history and reality. Now, we just seen this incident, which what we'll call Karen, because that's now the new term for white women who lose their shit. Karens. So we just seen this incident. I think this is in New York. Yeah, it's in New York, where a white woman has um, lost her phone and goes crazy on this teenage black boy. And the dad stood his ground and stood up and 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 did what he needed to do as a father. And I'm going to talk about fathers tomorrow when I talk about LeVar Ball. And um, he stood up and he said, my son ain't got nothing to do with this. You need to back on up, do your own thing, chill. And she's going off. She's falling all over the hotel. And this is going crazy because she had assumed that this black boy stole her cell phone, which he didn't. She ultimately ended up leaving her phone in an Uber. Karen's, man. I I've had Karen incidents. I'll tell some stories later. Uh, <laughs> man, it's 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 crazy. But again, it gets back into this trustworthy recorders and interpreters of history and reality. The reality part is the part that I want to focus on. Because again, that reality is this person is a thief. They did this to me. When we talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, Florida, when we talk about those places, we know those places have narratives of Karens, white women, who have accused black males of doing things in those communities being destroyed. There are other communities who have similar stories that we don't know the histories of, but they've been told from family to family. And that's the thing that we have to keep in mind because, again, Karens are going to do that because they have been put into a position to allow that to happen. And we have been conditioned to see them as trustworthy recorders of interpreters of history and reality. So what they say is the word, right? What they do is the word. And how does this happen? Because Karens, we can just talk about Karens. How this happened is they have been put in a position where they they condition us. They are the teachers of our children or the daycare providers of our children. They are the social workers that come into your home. Sometimes they're even the friends of the family. They do nice things. When you start playing sports, especially if you have athletes, uh, young athletes that are good, these are the parents that are on those booster clubs and those commission, them white moms, they're doing banquets. They're having everybody over. They're treating you right. They become, they become people that we confide in, right? When we get on our job, we're looking for the coolest white person on the job. Let's keep it real. And what ends up happening is that's how they become the trustworthy recorders of our history and our reality. You know, it used to be on the news, you would have a white male who was very articulate talking to you. Even me saying white men being articulate is like a shock to your system because usually you associate that with the black person, like Obama. But white people can not be articulate and they can as well. So when it came to media on the radio, on the television, when TV started to come, you would get white males that were articulate. But what happened? It started to shift in the mid 80s and the 90s. You started to get these blondes. Then they introduced them into sports. You get the side, the, the sideline reporter. Now we have white women as co-hosts. And I'm not coming at white women. I'm just pointing out the realities on how this stuff happens. So they become the trustworthy recorders of history and reality. But what is but one of the things that and I talk about Karen's and I, it's fascinating because Karen has become like this national phenomenon on how we understand this type of behavior, which is part of our black genius. We do this all the time where we we see something, we label it and it becomes a thing. And that's what Karen's is. I see there's actually a pretty popular YouTube channel. If you want to have a good night tonight before the ball drops, type in Karen's in the wild and you'll just see white folks going crazy. <laughs> All types of videos of white folks going crazy called Karen's in the wild on YouTube. 
it is a it, it's a hoot, man. Me and my wife sometimes we just like look, we ain't got nothing to watch. Let's see what's on Karen's and why we watch video after video, cracking up because this is something that's going on. And at some point, somebody's got to look at this psychology. And I always tease and say, you know, whenever I go get my PhD, I really want to study what happened to white folks who were part of lynchings and were part of all that that took place. Where did that mentality go? And I want to look at the psychology of white women. I know I'm not going to be able to get a PhD doing this. I'm going to have to get tenure before I can do this. They're going to run me out of here like Dr. Tommy Curry. But where does that Karen mentality come from? What is that about? Because that's not just an isolated incident. That is some stuff that needs to be researched thoroughly. What's up, Mark? Good to see you, man. Glad you're doing well. Hope you're having a, a good end to your 2020, my friend. So we have to think about that. So again, white oppressors are trustworthy recorders and interpreters of history and reality. Another thing that I wanted to mention about this that really that we really have to think about, especially as we go into this, we're already in this decade, right? 2020 was one of those years that we want to put behind us, but I think it really unveiled a lot of the truths that are happening. And we have to continue to build upon those truths to move ourselves forward uh, as we go into this new decade or as we continue on into this decade. We have to let go of the meme. And I keep bringing up memes. I'm going to bring them up all the time. We have to let go of the meme of saying they don't teach our history in schools. We got to stop saying that. We got to stop even assuming that they're going to teach our history in schools. That's not the school system's job to teach black history in schools. That's not their job. That's our job. As, as, as community members, we should be teaching our own history. We should not allow that to be to another group, period. Right now, I'm not saying that we should learn the history that we're learning in school now, because that's not really helpful either. Most of the history that I learned in school was just worthless. I mean, it was good to a certain extent, but not really. I haven't used any of that. We have to be we have to teach our own kids our own history. My daughters, the history that they know that came from me and a mom. And this is why I make content. I encourage you all to make content as well so they can find this history on their own and what they know. We can't allow other people to teach our children stuff that we feel is important. That's on us. And if you want them to teach it, it's not going to go with complaining. It's going to go with going to the parent teacher conferences, you know, going, be on, on that parent advisory board, being involved in the school system. We have to bring community back in the school if we want to make a change or we have to create alternatives because other ethnic groups don't complain about their history being taught to their kids. What they do is they hold Saturday schools, they hold programming where their kids learn stuff that they need to learn. They don't care about somebody else. They go, You go and get that American education so you can get in that American school so you can be successful. Everything else that's important in life, we got you covered here in the community. We have to do the same thing. We have to do the same thing. So we have to stop. That's our addiction because we expect white people to fix everything for us and do everything for us. We got to get rid of that, man. Look, it, we are too far in this world to be assuming that white people are going to fix all our problems or even teach our kids things. They're, they're going to do their job. And, and for black folks that have been in education, you know that it's a struggle to teach black kids because there's so many complex dynamics that go on. You, when are we going to get to teaching them the history? When we got behavioral issues, we're trying to catch them up with reading and arithmetic. Like we have to focus on the things that are important and stop being so damn emotional about stuff that we need to be doing at home. Don't get me on a pedestal. I don't, I don't want to get on a soapbox because <laughs> that, that drives me crazy, man. I've worked in schools. I've been a school-based therapist. I was a school-based therapist for four years. And the stuff that parents would complain about, it's like, well, but okay, before we get to that, let's talk about these other issues that are going on at home so we can work on, so we can make sure this student's even ready to be at school. Because a lot of students ain't even ready to be there. We have to break these white values that we have under this trauma lens in order for us to move forward. All right, I'm going to move on. So I'm starting to preach and I don't want to be, I ain't into preaching. So white value number four, individualism is better than collectivism. Hence, obligations to the group are subordinate to personal gains. Now, this also comes out of what I talked about, Dr. Edwin Nichols, and looking at that axiology of person to object. You know, we have to be able to move beyond that individualism. Into, but see, the twisted part about this, and 
when I get further in this book, I want to come back and talk more about this particular value is that in the system that we live in, in America, we kind of have to hold both of these areas. We have to hold the individualism piece and the collectivism and do kind of a both and. Because the way that this society is set up, it's set up with the ideas of presenting individualism, but things happening in a collective. One of the things that can benefit us as a people is if we work better together. This is why we always say that. But we can't do that if we're not going to work on our trauma. And what I, what me and Sam Simmons, we talk about this is like, how do we work on our trauma collectively? I don't know if we can. Because there's so much pain there. There's so much mistrust. There's so much shame. There's so much guilt in working on our trauma. We might have to do that individually. Like, like Mr. Fuller says, Mr. Billy Fuller Jr. says the united independent effort. That might be how we heal from our trauma. So we have to be able to understand that the healing is going to take place with us as individuals, but in the hopes that everybody's doing their healing work. But ultimately, in order to move forward, we collectively have to move as a unit. So that's a deeper concept. Again, collectively, everybody individually has to be doing their thing. The way I like to express this is that for me, I had to do my own healing work. Before I decided to do any clinical mental health work, I told myself, I need to go sit on the couch. If I'm going to have somebody sit on the couch across from me, I need to go sit on the couch. Hey, what's up, Char? Good to see you. I had to go do, I had to go sit on the couch myself because I knew it wasn't going to be right for me to listen to anybody else's trauma when I got my own stuff that I haven't filtered through and dealt with myself. So that's what I did. That was an individual effort for me to go and just start doing my own work. Now, I know that it doesn't stop there though. Because I have to, sh I share stories about myself all the time because that's how we connect as people. We're people to people. Darative is an important tool for us in our healing process. So I don't stop there, but I keep doing my individual work because I have to what? I have to be an influencer, right? I have to have some level of influence, share what I know. I didn't get two master's degrees to just put paper on my wall and feel good about myself. I need to share this information to help my community. That's the collective piece. Right. I also have to role model behaviors. When you see me out in the community, you see me presented in a particular way. And I keep those values and morals and those standards that I present for a reason, because people are watching young people and old people. That's how you present something different. But when you start changing up, people don't believe you. And they're like, oh, he ain't really like that. And we have to be able to we have to be able to role model who we are. We can't be faking and funking all the time. I had this young man tell another story. I had this young man, man, this hurt my heart. I, I hope this young man is doing well. I don't know where he is today, but I had this boy who, um, he, he was the oldest. He was like 13 years old, this big dude, 13 year old. He looked like he was about 15. Boy, he never played no sports. He was like, just a big old boy. And his mom brought him to therapy and he had anger issues. Crazy. Dad was incarcerated the whole nine. And, um, so his mom brings him to therapy. We I do therapy with him for about a month. And this was like in the summer. So spring's getting ready. It was like June. So fall was getting ready to come up. And I say, yo, we should try to get him to play football. So I talked to the mom and I said, I think it'd be good for him to get some of that aggression out by playing football. Plus this kid is big. He needs to be doing some activities to make sure his health is going to be good as he gets older. So she said, yeah, let's do it. So I we found um, the local rec center close to their house. They had a football team. He got on a football team. The kid was doing good. And then like a month, it was like, not even a month. Yeah, it was probably about a month and a half. It was like mid-September. He comes to session. I haven't seen him in a while. And I'm like, man, what's going on, man? How's football going? So I'm excited. Like, yeah, he's got in the football. He's like, man, I quit that. And I said, what happened? He said, Brandon, the coach just kept trying to have sex with my mom. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> he was like, man, I didn't want to do that. He's like, the coach kept trying to have sex with my mom. So I didn't want to do that no more. And that just hurt my heart because he lost all hope in that activity that was good for him because the coach kept trying to talk to his mom. Now, I don't know if anything happened between the coach and his mom, but he kept seeing that over and over and over, and that crushed him and his ideals of what that opportunity was like. And that's what I talk about motivating behavior. Like that's what I talk about role modeling behaviors. That that as that coach, you, you got to do something better than that, man. Don't be just trying to have sex with this boy's mom. 
especially if she ain't even giving you no, if it's not a legit thing, but you keep trying and this kid's seeing that, that hurts. And that's not uncommon. That happens all the time. Remember when I played football, there's tons of coaches trying to sleep with people's mamas and stuff. This stuff's crazy. And, and I really hope that kid's okay because he is prone to be out here doing all types of reckless behavior. And he's a big kid. At that time, he looked like he was about 15. And he was just going to the eighth grade. I can only imagine where he's at now. That was like five years ago. But again, we end up having these situations. We have to role model better behaviors for the collective. So I hope that makes sense. So again, the Y value number four, individualism is better than collectivism. That's one of the thoughts that we have. Hence the obligation to the group are subordinate to personal gains. Sometimes our personal gains are connected to our community, but we should have that in mind. I don't know who told me this when I was younger, but somebody said this to me. Maybe I read it, but it said, no matter what you go to college for, you should go to college in mind to help your people. And I always thought that. when I was, Originally, when I went to be a dentist, I wanted to be a dentist so I can go to the hood because I'd never seen a black dentist before. Then when I switched my major, I said, okay, if I'm going to be working with people, I'm going to do this mental health stuff, I'm going to do it for us. Because, again, my individual gains were really to help the collective. So we have to be able to work on that and move forward. So for 2021, hopefully we're doing that. All right, last one. Let me get ready to wrap up. White value number five. The best way to feel good about yourself is by surpassing, outdoing, and defeating someone in an activity, achievement, or personal characteristic. <laughs> if any of y'all remember... <laughs> What's up, Eric? If any of y'all remember the classic Jay-Z line, stunt, stunt, stunt on hoes. That's what this is. <laughs> the best way to feel good about yourself is by surpassing, outdoing, and defeating someone else in an activity, achievement, or personal characteristic. We have this sickness bad. This is an American value, by the way, too. I got to have a bigger house, bigger 401k, better Tesla, better dog breed right we gotta we can't go to the local food market whether it's cub or cubs as black folks say cubs food <laughs> cub foods Publix, right we got to go to whole foods trader joe's so we can stunt let people know we're getting organic right and that, yes it is definitely social dominance but social dominance is a part of humanistic behavior you see this it's a part of uh creatures just in general you see this amongst animals there is a social dominance theory there but our social dominance is limited as black people what do i mean by that we only want to be socially dominant amongst us we only want to dominate us because we have adapted anti-black values that are an offshoot of these white values so we only want to socially dominate another black person. We don't want to compete with nobody else but us. And then we get mad when they come into our territory, like when white women want to get braids or when they want to go get them BBL surgeries and get a little curves, then we want to complain. Because that's not their territory. They're not supposed to come in our area and dominate us like that. That's for us to dominate us. That is a sickness. We don't want to go dominate K-pop with the Japanese kids. We want to dominate us. In 2021, we got to stop trying to dominate one another. Even when we try to support one another, it might start off genuine, and then that trauma creeps up, and then the effort falls flat because we want to start stunting on one another. We see this in the fraternities and sororities and the social groups. We see this across all social economic statuses. Because I know when we get online and we start talking about black people, we talk about black people uh, that are that are the, the the working class and poor black folks. But this is black folks across the economic stat uh, statuses. The writer had other principles, but these were the main five that he focused on, Michelle. And again, this book is called Addicted to White. The Oppressed in League with the Oppressor, a shame based um, alliance. But he has some other ones. These are the five main ones that he utilizes, and he just breaks them down. He just breaks them down throughout the book. Like we we have to be able to work on this. Like th this is one of the main things that keeps us back is we get stuck at just 
stunting on one another all the time. Yep. Yeah, I'm reading I'm reading stuff. Sorry guys. <laughs> Aaron said, yeah, that is a treat um of people who have been successfully dominant in fighting brilliant work. Infighting's gonna happen no matter what the group is. It always happens. I've been on boards for organizations, infighting happens there. I've been on sports teams, infighting happens there. This is why you have human resource departments in places of employment. Because in fighting happens, conflict happens. This is when I when I teach when I do courses and I teach about social emotional intelligence. One of the things, one of the uh, principles of social emotional intelligence is relationship management. And one of the main things I teach there is how to manage conflict. You see this in families. You see this everywhere. Conflict is going to happen. It's a part of human nature. But when you create conflict just because you want to stunt on another black person, that is problematic. That is not natural. Okay, conflict is natural. You will have disagreements and you will not come in contact with things. But if you're deliberately creating a conflict to make yourself feel better, to build your own self-esteem, that's a problem. And that's one of the issues that we have because we have accepted through a trauma-based lens our own anti-black value system. We are stunting on hoes all the time. And when I say hoes, I'm not talking about actual hoes. Okay, I'm talking about just using that terminology because that's the mentality. We love to stunt on each other, floss on one another. And we learn this early. I've seen so many kids who are talking about other kids' clothing. Oh, what you got that from Old Navy? Ha ha ha. And they got one outfit from Nordstrom's rack, and you're eight years old, and they think that they just got everything because they've been taught a value system that is inaccurate at eight years old. We have to be able to move beyond this. Competition is natural. Competition is natural. What is unnatural is the debase of competition. But we also have to understand how to compete as black people. Our competition is not within our own community. Our competition is everybody outside of it. And they figured out that we won't compete and it's easy to feed off of our dysfunction. We'll crack jokes all day. We'll laugh at people. But at the end of the day, Collectively, we won't threaten any of their lifestyles. And until we start, and, and then here's the here's the trick, here's the trick bag, and I'm gonna close out. When we collectively do get together and start to threaten stuff, what do we see? We see changes happening very quickly, which is what we seen after the murder of George Floyd. Society said, Oh snap, we gotta make some changes. Now the changes might not be effective. Let's just be honest about it. Singing the, the Black National Anthem before an NFL game don't make my life no damn different. But it is a change nonetheless. But we have to be in position collectively to make sure the changes that are necessary to move our community forward are changes that we implement that are actually going to benefit us. Because if we let foot, entertainers, period, who have already been conditioned in the entertainment industry to not really move the community forward. If we let those folks make these decisions on what change looks like, we ain't gonna change a damn thing. And this is why I always stress, we need lawyers. We need people that understand law <laughs> making these decisions, not Benjamin Crump, <laughs> okay? <laughs> not just him. We need more people, can't be one person. But again, that's how we get caught up is we gotta have that person on top, no. We need to have multiple people who are in sync with a cultural understanding on what needs to be done and understand law. Because in this country, that's what makes things move. Money, policy, and procedures. So on that note, happy holidays, everybody. I'm going to stop running my mouth. Uh, I'm going to swing back tomorrow early, talk about LeVar Ball. We need to put some respect on LeVar Ball's name. The man's put three sons into the NBA came out and said he was going to do it and made it happen. I don't care how they play. They made it. I don't care what they do or who they date. doesn't matter. I don't care who their mama is. There's a black man who said it was a father who said, I want this for my boys and made it happen. That's important. We all need to have a little bit of LeVar, LeVar Ball inside of us for our children so our children go out there and compete and become the number one stunners <laughs> that we are. Stop stunting on each other and let's stunt 
on society and let's do better for black people. I am Brandon Jones. Welcome to the Jegna Institute. I will see you all next time. Thank you. Hotep and Bill. Peace, family. <laughs>